The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Hello again. Welcome back to the room. I see a lot of familiar faces. I'm sure you're probably looking for us tonight and you're not able to get out of here. Uh, my name is David Stokes. I'm a community manager for MySQL. That means this oral PhD to go around the world evangelizing on MySQL products. I'm also your conduit back to Oracle Manager. If you have a complaint, a gripe, a suggestion, or something you just want upper management to know, please give it to me. Uh, looks like Oracle is a caring company, but I can guarantee you that they <coughs> agonize for every complaint or suggestion they have. Uh, if you want to copy these slides, slideshare.net slash Dave Stokes. Uh, they're all out there. Um, I was in this big presentation last week in Austin and technically set and you'll see that there are some different names of these. Uh, we'll see it out there on the top of the list. My email is david.stokesoracle.com and my Twitter handle is at Stoker. Got to warn you about that, there's an independent movie called Stoker starring Cole Kidman. And unfortunately there's no connection between the two of us. <laughs> uh, if you've ever seen an oracle presentation, this is what we call our safe harbor agreement. I'm talking about something that has not been shipped with the bills, keeping it <coughs> or price tag, um, taken with a grain of salt. I might be saying it's blue. You're thinking Rob is saying blue. I'm thinking certainly blue and actually ends up being India. Okay, this presentation is mainly for folks who get told, oh, by the way, you also got to take care of the database, which I think is probably going to be the majority of this crowd. Now, there's an interesting analog to the poor developer who gets stuck being the DBA. And that's a study that came out earlier this year from Boston's Brigham and Women's University. They took a group of highly trained radiologists. These are people who look at x-ray slides. And they can interpret smears, dots, little opaque sections on an x-ray of a lung and say that tuberculosis, that's cancer, that's just a bad image with like 98, 99% the degree of accuracy. So these researchers thought it would be very interesting on the 10th and 10th slide that they put a picture of a guy in a girl suit on the slide. So imagine you're doing two stats and then there's a little girl that pops up on your screen. Um, anyway, 83% of the radiologists did it spot. So uh, the memorial primate on the slide. And the, the radiologists were uh, just not trying to see that, so they ignored it. And if you're not a DBA, there's lots of things that you're not paying attention for. By the way, uh, girls said they're already well to the story of the study. <laughs> uh, if you're a developer and you don't agree with this, please raise your hand. Databases are the nasty rock children of the software world. I will admit that. Uh, used to be my pet bar when I was developing. So how do you get happy MySQL databases or databases in general? Well, hopefully I'll be able to teach you some of those, the practices. Big trouble is in an hour I can't really teach you everything you need to know. No more than an hour session on an Arduino or PHP will make you an expert in most of that. But these are some general hints. First thing, how does a database server work? On the left hand side, we have some SQLs. In this case, we're saying, collect the phone number from the friend's table where name equals Joe. And that table is in memory. So the server parses the SQL, <coughs> the SQL syntax, goes out, and find the general entry for the row in the current in table, and returns the phone number to the client program. Now those of you who are still awake should be asking, what was that about memory? 
But again, make sure you have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of memory for your database servers. What if it's not in memory and you're running Linux? Uh, when I ask you over about the operating system, it says, okay, I need the friends table. And the operating system gets the I/O for the friends table, asks the data off the disk, passes it into a buffer, and that buffer <coughs> off, and my SQL will put it in memory. Much, much, much slower process. Uh, so, number two, big hint. Uh, databases do nasty I/O patterns. The old heavy down Dell, ME, Windows ME box that you've got from the Warrior accounting, which you've got to do off for a while. It's not going to be any good server. <laughs> um, about 5% of the customer sites I walk into, I, I find that. Um, buy some piece of hardware. Okay, let's go back to that scenario again. Uh, for those of you who don't write device drivers, uh, this is kind of what it looks like to get stuck between the disk and the memory. So you have disk and disk controller, or cache, cache, and you use a buffer. The right hand side, memory lookup, 100 nanoseconds on current hardware. Left hand side, disk, disk C, 10 milliseconds. Okay. A disk read is 100,000 times slower than reading memory. Uh, 100,000 seconds, by the way, is about 17 and 3 quarters hours. So, this is where I wish I would know just kind of say, it's slow. <laughs> So I'll say this two years ago when I started giving this talk. Maybe one out of 100 people in an audience <coughs> would use solid state disks. Uh, I think there's probably three in this room. Uh, how many are in solid state? One, two, three, okay. Um, as these get more and more popular, I'm expecting to see a lot more of these in the database world. You're also now seeing for under 150 bucks uh, solid state drives back to our regular drive. So before it goes longer, it's time to be, if you don't have one of these, what's wrong with you? So hardware organizations, memory, lots of it, error correcting, best you can get. Uh, disk drives, the more you spread things out over different drives, different spindles, the better. If you're not having your log files on the same disk drive as your <coughs> contentious data. Um, raise can if you can, put on the right back cache, we're going to cache a little later. Um, XFS, VFS, ASP4, not ASP2 or 3 for your file system. Caches, there's two types of caches in this control rule. Right through, which means it gets the data and pushes it right on to the device. And there's right back, which tells you, okay, I'll cue it to right and you can return back to processing whatever you're doing. Both lie to you a little bit. Both have to be monitored. Uh, the big trouble is it's the battery backup on these things last four hours, and your service level agreement with your hardware vendor is eight hours, you're going to have four hours of cursing yourself before the service deck actually shows up. Because you gave the data four hours before. CPUs, uh, Peter Pike said, we were talking about this earlier, um, but I always felt that I.O. and memory is more important than processor speed. Uh, with MySQL 5.6, we've been trying to scale bigger and better newer processors. This might change in the future, but I really recommend spending your money on I.O. disks and memory. Uh, tomorrow morning, for tomorrow afternoon, I'm talking about the uh, user authentication system. This causes a lot of headaches for admins. Uh, the quick run through for this is to try to understand how it works. Uh, the default MySQL login privilege system is a little primitive. We've improved it over the last two releases, but at the basic, at the basic part, it's still pretty good. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. As a junior DBA, a wannabe DBA, be stingy with cribs. Uh, don't give them out. Uh, the drop table privilege you give out today because someone has it more quickly for a development project that they promise they won't uh, use will backfire the day before panel last on. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, some of you have heard this joke. Uh, PHP MyAdmin used to give out drop privilege to every new account. And for those of you who don't know what that means, just take drop privilege and replace it with drop laptop or drop baby. Uh, something you don't want to have done. Okay, security warnings. 
When you go to log in to MySQL, the first thing it checks is, is your host allowed to connect to this server? If the host is whitelisted, it will then go through and check to see if the username and password are correct. <coughs> Sounds fairly mm -hmm. reasonable. Uh, the short problem is that your boss working at home, coming from AT&T.net, might have a cat with different privileges than coming in from the 10.10 .10 network at work. Uh, you usually find this out as you try to do your performance review from home. Mm -hmm. By the way, that does not impress your boss and find that the privileges are different. Uh, as of MySQL 5.6, we have to have proxy and plugable logins. Proxies are great because you say Peter at 10.10 .10 is going to be one of the accounting folks going into the system. So you don't have to, for every user, go back and copy what the accounting folks have. You say Peter is an accountant. Away you go. Uh, something else you need to know is the login information and all the privileges are kept in memory. So every DBA has done this. I'll see a couple of these people in your room. If you're ever typing and you're making changes to grants and privileges, and suddenly the, it, okay, try it, try it. Nothing's going on. You have to type a command called flush privileges. Flush privileges. That says, okay, take the updates, write them in memory. Uh, every DBA has fallen for that at least once. I also recommend using a GUI rather than running SQL, like I showed you earlier on Workbench. Uh, the creating a new account by hand using SQL is very, can be very, very messy if you want to set uh, certain privileges. Uh, one thing I like about Workbench is MySQL has no predefined roles. So if you have someone who's going to be uh, a user admin, you click here, and it automatically gives you the privileges that you, this person has, and writes it out for you. Uh, the SQL is messy <coughs> and error from when you try to type it in. Recommendation number four, use a current release of MySQL. Uh, besides the obvious thing is bug fixes. Uh, if you went from 5.1 to 5.5, you've got roughly 20% better performance. There's nothing else in the last stack that will give you that sort of change. Going to PHP 5.5 ain't going to do it. Going to later versions of Apache ain't going to do that. Going to a trio kernel or later in Linux isn't going to do it, but you do it in MySQL. Uh, MySQL 5.6 for most people seems to be another 15% faster. The big features with MySQL 5.6 is it's better optimized. In the past, you used to have to rewrite some queries at joint, which meant if you worked with a object request broker or a tool that was written for select work, um, to get it to run efficiently, you had to do a lot of rewriting of queries. Uh, we also had the ability to do no SQL by memcached to the same data. So if you need to do a key pair value system um, and you don't want to go out by another set of disk drives, and you need to access the same data with people. Uh, it's very nice. The other thing is online DDL. It used to be that if you were making a change to a table, the MySQL did the original table, put it in memory, created a rough clone of it in memory, and then started moving stuff back and forth. Very slow, took up a lot of memory, very contentious, took a long time, and you the weekend. Uh, now it's on the fly. Once again, the performance of the later versions are much, much, much better, much, much, much tighter. Uh, some of the earlier versions um, from the MySQL AD days and some days uh, were not as well integrated. Uh, Army Storage Engine, UODB, was a separate company that was bought by Oracle 10 years ago. And now that we have both teams, third team and the UODB team, are the same management. Uh, I've just been going through this sort of the fine-tooth comb to find out all the spin locks, all the mutexes and everything else that they absolutely can get rid of. And when you do that, you get much, much better performance. 
Visitor number five. Um, you're doing your, your development role, and somebody calls up and says, Get me some spot! Oh my god, get me some spot! By the way, they never, never called and called me and said, Oh, by the way, it didn't make sense that it's kind of slow. Uh, so, get me some spot! Uh, you need some sort of tool that you can look at and get a mental snapshot of what's going on in the system. Uh, there's lots of monitoring tools out there. This is PHP MyAdmin. It's free. Uh, it's uh, been around for a long time. This is MySQL Workbench. It's also free. It's been around for not quite as long. Uh, there's also a manuals, cat guy, uh, other things out there that will monitor your stock, your, your MySQL server. Please, please monitor your databases. As I said earlier, the destructive lots of children of the software world. And when something goes wrong, it's nice to be on something like this that graphically tells you what's going on. Usually in my experience, the guy who calls up and tells me the database is slow, but complains later that the screen isn't updating, and he complains later that the power's gone off and it's going. But it's still the database is slow! Something else you should do. Uh, maybe not all the time in the middle of the shop, but every so often. Just turn on the slow query log. What this does is there's also a uh, threshold value you set, usually set to one second. This logs all the queries that take longer than that threshold value. So things that run a long time, you have a record of. Now, not all long running queries are bad. If you're going through the customer mailing list and it's quite large and it has to go from A to Z in the customer mailing list, it'll take some time. But that's the odd query to throw out right away because you recognize what it's doing. The other thing is you can log the queries by getting indexes. We'll go to indexes a little bit later. Now, the hard part of all this is when you turn on logs, if someone consciously needs to read the logs, if you have a MySQL Enterprise monitor, it reads the logs for you, it will come up and give you messages saying you need to increase this buffer size or you're having trouble with this query. But if you're not running that, every morning when you get in and you get your cup of coffee, cruise through the logs. Uh, once again, use monitoring software. I uh, really recommend Enterprise Monitor if you can. But you really need something there to watch the system while your map is turning. It's just remember, you might not see the problem, but it surely sees you. Thing number six to do. Backups. You have to do backups. A SAM is not a backup. Replication is not a backup. A backup is taking the data and either doing an LDM style snapshot or serializing the data out to a file. Once you have that data, you and your staff have to practice recovering from that. Because if you don't know how to recover an entire database, or just a table, or just a line from the table, um, you're basically wasting time and money. And your bosses will not be happy with you. Uh, one thing I highly recommend is, especially in the development shop, to set up a slave server, have that slave copy everything from the master. Uh, once a day, shut down the arrow thread between the master and the slave, and through cron on my SQL dot, to save everything. That way, if your developer happens to crash your system, working, working late one night, you come the next morning, and you have a lost that data. And the other thing with backups, be paranoid. A shop that I know of, and a set of backups on premises in another building from the main data center, and a set of backup tapes at a company that's in the, that will sell you storage of backup area. Basically, you, that courier shows up, grabs your copy of your backup tape, and stores it for you. Worked really great until they had an earthquake in Northridge, California. Uh, their servers were knocked about. And then once you get the backup tapes from the other building, you couldn't get into the other building, because the other building had collapsed. No problem, we'll go to Iron Mountain and get the other tapes. Iron Mountain wasn't there. Uh, be paranoid. 
Replication. Replication in MySQL is a typing exercise. Replication in Oracle, Postgres, and just about every other database out there is a exercise of frustration. Oracle replication, the first time you do it, will be typing for a week and hit return and nothing will happen. Uh, so you have to Postgres is almost as frustrating. What happens in replication is master has its copy of data and it writes out the changes to a log file. <coughs> a slave server will come along and grab the information from that log file and apply it to its own copy of the data. So therefore, if everything's ideal, you have two copies of the same data. We offer two types, uh, asynchronous, which means the master just keeps going in the model in a canary way to secure any of the slave test information. And semi-synchronous. Uh, semi-synchronous, at least one of the slaves that have a copy of the data, and it's committed to this, but we have received a copy of the data before the, server, the master server is allowed to go on. If the semi-synchronous replication crashes, it falls back to asynchronous. Uh, in the past, replication was terribly messy. Uh, with MySQL 5.6, we now have a global transaction ID. What that means is every, um, every committed statement has a unique identifier. <coughs> And the slave servers know which one is part of this process and which one doesn't happen. So if it runs across something that somehow there's been a verb and it's processed before, it knows not to process it. Uh, the other thing to watch on replication is your network. Uh, try to keep your servers on home run between each other. Uh, an LDAP server and a mail server on the same line as your replication will kill all three. Um, in the past, I used to tell people that your slaves don't need to be as fast as the master server. Uh, several of our tech support folks are trying to convince me otherwise that the slaves need to be bigger battery machines than your master because they have more work to do. So I'm kind of not looking at it there. Another thing is replication. You don't have to replicate everything. Uh, things that are vital work to your bosses, replicate. Uh, tables, uh, receivables, uh, personnel files are great. Um, things like state abbreviations. We have an enemy state in the US that's long before I was born. So if you have a table that's under the state abbreviations, maybe just pull it out of a backup case if you ever lose. Now, this is a fairly common uh, example of what goes on with replication out uh, a lot of web. Developers will help you. You have an application and a load balancer. And what we've got to do is split the reads and writes. We have two replicated slaves out here that do nothing but answer reads. And we have a master out here that takes care of writes and a couple of reads. So you write to one master, read from any of the boxes out here. Um, great for read intensive applications. Now, if you're using MySQL 5.4 or 5.5 as the next generation driver and you install MySQL MD underscore MS Heckle extension, you can actually do your PHP code to monitor what goes on with the slaves and the master. And I'll know what slave I wrote the last time. And also figure out which one is the least heavily loaded. So you might go over here the load balance. And it will automatically write to the correct, well, write to the right, correct box or reasonably heavy use of these boxes. Something we used to do in replication, for row-based replication, we have two types of replication. Statement-based replication, the SQL code that makes a change to a table was actually sent down to the slave, and the slave executed it on its copy of the data. And we also have row-based replication, which is the output of the, of the result of the SQL statement being run. Now in the past, we used to, we made a change to these two columns in this entire row. Uh, we used to send it all over. Now we've gotten smart, and we're going to send it with a primary key and the columns have changed. Much less processing power, much less bandwidth. That makes it a lot nicer. 
In the past, um, by five and before, in ODB, we keep this data in a table, and if something crashed, you would know how to go from what transactions were pending and which were had been committed. And we used to keep all of the log files for replication in a separate file. And it's very, very easy for things like that for the two to get out of sync. So someone got the 30 watt away all over their head and said, well, what if you took this file and made it a NMDB table? So that if something does crash <coughs> and NMDB comes back to life, it knows what's been committed and what happened, and it can rebuild everything. The uh, big message here is that we're trying to get it to be worried and reputation about the hardware rather than the software. So now we're claiming that the crash state is displayed, and we're just about there. The other thing we added is just in case something burbles on the transmission between the master and the slave, we have a checksum. We can set it up so that if it doesn't pass checksum, it doesn't get applied. So we're trying to, like I said before, we're trying to get it to be worried about the hardware or about the software. Recommendation number eight, use NODB. Uh, in the past, we used to say if you need longer reads, go my ISAM. If you need acid compliance, you need transaction to use NODB. So our engineer is very, very busy with NODB and it far surpasses what my ISAM can do now. Uh, with this work we're doing on the optimized online DDL, uh, we do a SSD optimization where you can actually write the same page size as your SSD disk. So you We also have a way to keep the hardware cooling warm. Uh, if your system is going down, it saves a copy of the data so when it comes back up. The optimizer knows how to optimize queries because it has good statistics. Uh, in the past, it didn't have those statistics, and some suggestions have made for running your queries were not always optimal. Uh, also, with that for buffer tool, um, it's great for the top. If you need to spin over another instance, you already have a little set of the data. So once again, you need no SQL access for it by a cache feed. Uh, when I first started working in MySQL, right before NRDB really got popular, you uh, <coughs> kind of moved the MySQL files around using a CP command, which was kind of dangerous, but not that dangerous. Uh, now with NRDB, uh, you lock a table for export and you can actually take a copy of the data and move it around and move it to the server. So if you're kind of floating your own cloud in-house or trying to uh, do something quickly dirty with the data, it's there. That's fairly elastic. Uh, if you're doing software as a service, um, it's a godsend. <coughs> you can get set up and run. And as you see here, we have the export command, uh, create a table, uh, push table C for export, you have the, the table there, and you can read it down here. How many of you have bosses that are saying, gee, we've got to have no SQL access to our data because that's what we're reading all the trivia rules that we have to have? Uh, about two years ago, Android Socket came out, which was kind of a nice but messy way of getting the data. And our engineer looked at it and said, yeah, this is a little bit nicer way to do it. So, if you're coming into your SQL on the disk, hit the server, uh, hit the handler API, get it optimized, uh, get, uh, check if your SQL's uh, valid, and then you get sent to the storage engine. If you come in by a mem cache, uh, you're out, get rid of the other end of the parser or the optimizer and go straight to the data. It's actually nine times faster. So if you have something on the web and you're already doing memcache, this would be an easy fit. And the good news is you can now make your memcache information like you can use the session data, you can make it persistent. And all of them send disk drives. Uh, once again, the optimizer, uh, we're really trying to make this 
draftsman can ever read. Uh, the execution times are absolutely uh, staggering the reduction. Uh, because you're running very complex <laughs> queries, um, you'll be much happier with it. And uh, we've done some tricks like index condition push down, uh, batch key access, and multi range read that if you uh, want to know more about, I can show you the, the details on that. But the basic result is we're just trying to make this thing free. Indexes. How many of you have a good idea what database indexes do? And how many know how well they're defined in the SQL query standards? Trick question because they're not defined in SQL query standards. Um, every database under your staff, how well do you support the standards? And they say, oh, we support everything. Well, if you have indexes, you, you know uh, indexes are in the standards. The rough rules are developers to look at columns used on the right hand part of the statement. Uh, used in joins or after or where. Uh, what indexes let you do is go right to the record that you want. There's some sort of thing like a social security number or a user number, and then you can go right to the record you want. Without an index, the best safe way I can uh, give an analogy for this is imagine if you're looking for the plural of the word loose in a dictionary. Well, the dictionary is in an alpha order, it's kind of in scramble. And there might be more than one entry in there, and you have to read all of them, which means you have to start at the front of the book, read all the way through. And once you read all the way through, you remember where those other two instances is, or what were the instances the word loose was, and you go back to the plural. Uh, that's what life is like without an index. Very, very, very much slower. By the way, anyone here know the plural of the word moose? Good. The plural of moose is moose. Indexes are bad. Um, as you have indexes, you can notice some room that needs to be kept for their keeping. This means they need space, they take time, uh, they need maintenance every so often. And you can have too many indexes. Uh, they're not a panacea. If you're doing a full table scan, because you're going through the customer order list, and you have to go from A to Z, uh, the indexes are not going to help you. Uh, the other thing is, you can use composite indexes, and they can help you. If you have an index on, say, year, month, day, that index is great for year, month, day, year, month, and year. One index for four different types of queries. Now, occasionally you run developers that will stick you with something like day month year, which tends to be not as useful.
Now, if you're currently running the same query over and over again, please put it in something like an MCACHD or another caching program. Or if you're really deaf, if you're running like a sports book and they want to know what the odds are on the rooms and the family cup, put it in your application. Uh, turn off the query cache and let the, the data and have the memory for something else. Okay, you walk out of here, Monday morning you wake up and you go, gee, I remember some of that talk, I remember the polar bear, but where do I go get help? Um, there's a couple of books I recommend. Uh, High Performance Mass QL, third edition, make sure it's the third edition. Uh, second edition sells a lot cheaper, it's not as good. Um, Peter Zach said, walk around with a couple of copies, you might be able to make one on the hand. Uh, second is the Moscow Winter Bible by Sherry Cabral. Uh, if you're a junior DBA, that will have some wonderful examples of the common things you're going to have to do. There's also a series of books, all roughly 100 pages on various subjects like query tuning, replication, Arnold Bradford, uh, no profit, very direct. Ms. Cabral, who is my son, Mr. Bible, also runs a weekly podcast. Uh, they're five or ten minutes, and they're called our SQL Podcast on rsql.com. Uh, they're simple little podcasts that cover things like doing LBM snapshots or query tuning or what the differences are between Maria 55 and my SQL 55. Uh, they're well done. And she had a senior DBA. Uh, do a great job on that. Uh, we also have at forums.mysql.com like 26 different sections. So if you want to know a question of performance tuning or something specific on the NODB, put a question out there. And in a couple hours, you'll have at least an name on it to answer. Also, on farms.mysql.com, we aggregate all the blogs from the MySQL community. So if you want to find out what Peter's doing for Kona, uh, what the guys at Facebook are doing, or Cruz, Also, check in your area for a user group. I know there's one in Raleigh, I'm not sure. I think there's one here in Charlotte. Uh, if you want to start a user group, please see me later, and there's some stuff I can do to help you. Um, I don't recognize anyone here being from Skies too well. Um, if you read the popular press, especially when it's love to uh, sling mud, um, the folks at Skies who are particularly Monty say they can never find out what Oracle's plans are for MySQL. And I've been running this slide in my slide deck for about a year, which means I get some of them showing from my talk. But this is what Oracle is planning to do with MySQL for the next couple of years. Um, so, I need to show that to Max. Let me show that. <laughs> We're at our own conference, right before we run the America's Cup to wind up in San Francisco. Uh, we had 220, 230 folks uh, submit for 62 seeking spots. Uh, it's good if you can come and listen to the folks who play this play, talk about the international cluster and the most popular online game in South America. Uh, you can talk to Google and Facebook about what they do, Twitter about the optimization they run. Um, there's a couple of government agencies that will talk about some of the slide stuff that we're doing last QL. Uh, we're going to have two days of conferences followed by six tutorials on Monday. Uh, book early, because America's Cup is coming out at the same time, the hotel rooms might be hard to get. And the early bird pricing, I think, ends next week. Uh, out of the Boston Users Group, they run a virtual self study course called My Skill Marinade. It is free. You do one chapter a week in a book called Marine Life Too Well. That's been published by our line for the past five or six years. So you should be able to find a copy, uh, maybe on a co order shelf or a half price book or something like that. And um, it's virtual, it's online. You upload your answers to GitHub. And a very senior DBA will double check your work. So if you know someone who wants to learn MySQL from scratch and they don't want to spend a lot of money and they want someone looking over their shoulder, this is it. They also meet online for folks who have questions. 
And if you are in the Boston area, you get a you get a for coffee and can carry through every week. Okay. Q and A. Once again, the slides are available. Slide share by that. Yes, sir. Um, is there a reason why some people would put their data on Postgres versus MySQL? Um, they favor one database over the other. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one thing that most people notice when they may go to MySQL or Postgres is, oh my God, I just can't get paid to get out. They're a lot more verbose and they're running their material out on disk. Uh, performance wise, other than geographical stuff, I think we win. Uh, Christopher Pettis might <laughs> argue that. Um, I cut my feet with Postgres Professional. It's a great database, although I'm here with Postgres. Where? Get the foot up. Yes, sir. Have you got a 200 gigabyte database and you practically have on Linux? What's the best thing to think about? A 210 gigabyte backup on Linux. Um, are you already in Oracle shop? Yes. Um, do they run the big Oracle backup devices? We run Oracle databases, but we don't use our name to manage file shares and file shares. Well, in that case, you can just say, hey, I've got this instance over here, and it's your backup location. Because the video guard man backup unit will back up last four databases now. Our name is it. Not our man, the backup unit that's pointing to our man. I forget the, the name of that. Uh, after that, I recommend something like MySQL Enterprise Backup or Kona's FDB Backup. Uh, but if the big, big database guys in your shop are backing stuff up, adding you know a tiny database like that, uh, would be a could be a problem. Okay. Yeah, okay. Check with your uh, Oracle VB and see what your what version of these on. I'll forget the acronym for the backup. Um, it's a system that they use to basically run the big data libraries. I've always worked at the cheap shop, but I couldn't afford it that sort of hardware. You know, we're doing our backups to Bible on that, doing our backups and Oracle using our main scripts and stuff. Yeah. Um, if you can't go with the big Oracle backup unit, um, for Kona FDB, MySQL Enterprise uh, backup, uh, LVM snapshots, depends on your, what your, what your favorite technique is. But uh, I know folks are doing mobile uh, petabytes doing a good result. Anyone? Well, thank you all for coming out. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be here all weekend. I'm probably going to be here for a couple more hours to so catch in more. And thank you all for coming out. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet.
you can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources, and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people. Uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the Cloud Stack.
When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked.